Welcome to Ask the Expert. My name is Christopher and today we're going to talk about digital signal processing. I am really excited to introduce Jan. We have been fortunate enough to get an audience today with you. Uh, Jan, can you talk a little bit about what you do here at Don Audio? Yes, hello and thank you for inviting me. No problem. Uh, yes, I'm the CTO of Dyn Audio. That means I'm the Chief Technical Officer. And as such, I'm overall responsible for all our technologies and all our research activities. So everything that has to do with what kind of technology do we use in the products, what kind of uh, technology do we buy from outside or, and modify, and what do we do internally in our research projects. Mm. And as I said, we're really, really excited to have you here. But uh, let's get started with the first question. Jan, we have a question from Eric Miner, and he asks why we haven't included or implemented uh, balance control in the Zero series of loudspeakers. Yes, well, first of all, it's perfectly doable, yeah. no, no problem. But uh, what we assume when we design the Zero speakers is that usually you have a, a pre-amplifier where you have a balance control or you have an app or something like that where there's also a mixer on your uh, mobile phone for instance. So there's usually a lot of other ways to do the balance control. So usually we don't consider the balance control part of the speaker system. Okay. And it also rem uh, makes me uh, think a little more about why a balance control in the first place. Because actually a balance control is meant for this, that situation where you're not seated directly in the middle in front of your speakers. That's what we call the sweet spot. Yeah. And if you're off to one of the sides, well then you're closer to one of the speakers. And the speaker you're closer to is louder, mm. but it's also earlier in time. So the tra sound travels faster. No, it uh, takes a uh, shorter time to come to the listening position. Okay. Yes. So there's both a level difference and a time difference. Yeah. And with an ordinary uh, balance control, you only cure the one of them, the level differences. And since the, our human brain actually uses both the time difference and the level difference in different frequency bands to figure out where is the sound image, then you only cure part of it. Okay. So I would say that if we were to actually implement such a balance control in the Zero series or other of our loudspeakers, we would certainly do a better job. So we would do a more advanced balance control where we actually cure both the level difference and the time difference. Yeah. Just do it right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Hans van Klei. He asked whether it would be possible to cure uh, flaws or imperfections in the signal chain. You mean like in the DA converter or things like that? Yeah. Yes. Well, if we uh, focus on the DA converter, a lot of the flaws in a DA converter is actually predictable. Okay. And that's the key word here. Anything in that signal chain that is perfectly predictable, or you could say stable, mm -hmm. is perfectly curable. Even nonlinear uh, uh, problems can okay. be cured as long as they are stable. So, and we can make a model of it. Mm. And that's actually also known from the MQA. M MQA is a system where you can have high res in normal resolution files. Okay. And in part of this system is actually also to calibrate the DA converter. So to try to compensate for some of the flaws mm. in the DA converter. But that's perfectly possible, yes, and we do it to a large extent. Okay. Yes. Um, my brain starts thinking instantly, so could, how can you do that? Can you maybe you know elaborate a little bit on some of the methods you use? As I say, uh, the fundamental thing is first to find out, is it stable? Yeah. Is it predictable? If it is so, and uh, you can do that by simply taking a lot of samples, you know, different speakers and actually measure the things and see if it's the same all okay. the time. Yeah. If it is the same all the time, you have to make a mathematical model of what is going on. Mm. In, for instance, if it's simply a uh, change depending on frequency, a filter, it's perfectly uh, curable by just the inverse filter. Okay. Yes. But even nonlinear things can be cured as well, as long as you have a model that actually fits the physics that you're operating in. 
So this part of the system mm. we're talking about. So it's about figuring out the s stable flaws and, and trying to cure them. Exactly. It could also be like non-linearities in, in the drive units and things like this. That can ultimately also be cured in, uh, in DSP. Okay, there's a lot of things that we can do. Oh yeah, <laughs> we are only at the very beginning at this stage, yes. It's uh, very exciting. Yeah. Ernst, he has another question for us, uh, Jen, and it's um, about the time domain. He asks whether or not it's possible to solve a time domain issue in the frequency domain by math. Yes, well that's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, actually, what you have to understand is that time domain, frequency domain, is actually the same thing. It's just two different ways to see the same object. Okay. Yeah. Where in mathematical terms we say there's a full duality between the two domains. Okay. That means that anything in the one domain has the same, has a dual situation in the other domain. So, for instance, when we do a time domain filter, a low pass filter, you can do that by implementing the convolution of uh, the impulse response. Well, you can also do the same thing also in frequency domain, where the convolution actually turns into a multiplication. Okay. So sometimes it's more efficient, more practical to do in one domain rather than the other domain. But if you really want to, if you're really passionate about the one domain, you can stay in that domain mm. and do all your stuff or go to the other domain. Okay. It's so sometimes it also depends what is the more practical and what is the more efficient mm. way. For instance, let me just give one uh, example. If you have a very, very long impulse response, it would be very inefficient to do it in time domain. Mm. Whereas if you do it in frequency domain, the longer the impulse response is, the more, uh, more efficient it is in frequency domain. So in yeah. the end... But in, in effect, Everything that can be done in one domain also can be done in the other domain. Mm. can be more uh, complicated, it can be more inefficient, things like that, but you can also always do in both domains. Mm. Yeah. So uh, in the end it's about yeah. either being a bit passionate about one domain or the yeah. other, or yeah. being focused on practicality. Or how your general layout of your signal flow is. So maybe you already do other processes in the frequency domain, then you tend to stay in the frequency yeah. domain. Or if uh, the rest of the signal chain, all the operations are done in time mm. domain, you might stay in time domain. Mm. Yes. Great. As you can see, guys, we've moved the tables out and brought a whiteboard in. And that's because Jan, he's uh, about to draw. And that's because we have some questions from uh, Sebastian Roy. We actually have a lot of questions that are about the DFT. Uh, it's about the uh, set transform and it's about convolution. And you have something mm -hmm. that you want to show us, Jan? Yes, because before diving into any of these questions, I just think it would be nice for us to actually remind ourselves what is the fundamentals of DSP? Why can we do it without mm -hmm. loss of any uh, information? Yeah. Yes, and it all usually starts in analog. Then we make a digital yeah. to do the DSP and digital domain, mm. and then usually we go we go back to analog to the power amplifier to the drive unit. Yeah. Yes, uh, we can look at things in time domain or in frequency domain. And let's just take one random example. If we take a time signal, it could look like, let me show this, it could be something like, something like this. Yeah. On purpose, I have not drawn just a simple sinusoid, but it's more complicated. Mm. Yes. Um, if you take this signal into the frequency domain, then in frequency domain, it looks like this. Well, in the middle, usually, you have the zero hertz. Yeah. yeah. And then you usually have different levels, something like this. But then you actually have something which is 
Well, clo- it is symmetrical. Excuse mm. my <laughs> drawing up here. It has to be actually completely symmetrical. Okay. Because if it is symmetrical in here, this is a pure, uh, purely real signal. Okay. So it's not complex, so it doesn't have an imaginary part to it. Okay. So that's why if this is symmetrical. Mm. And when we do it in digital, what we actually do is to sample. Yeah. You heard about this before. So we are going at certain times. Like and measure this. the signal. What is the signal? And we note what is the signal, these instances of time. Mm. And we do this usually in a re- much or very regular way. Yeah. So for instance, uh, at 44.1 kilohertz, that's 44,100 times a second. Yeah. This is the sampling rate that we know from the old CD, mm. compact disc. In more modern systems, we are 96 kilohertz, or 192 kilohertz, or 384 kilohertz. Mm. So uh, nowadays, it's more than 100,000 times a, a second. second. Yeah, yes. that's a that's a lot. Yeah, it is. Uh, so you can say now we just note in digital. It's simply a, uh, it's a point now. Mm. So it's an so it's just a point, a level at that time and another level at this time and another and so forth yeah yeah so have something like this right mm. so that's in digital what happens over here and now i'm drawing a bigger frequency yeah why is this this is because now everything is actually just like before But it repeats. It repeats now. So if you have the sampling frequency, yeah. so that was the number of times per second that we note what is the mm. signal. You can actually make a duplicate of this over here. So a perfect copy. Well, I, I'm not that good at uh, doing perfect here, but something like this. Mm. So for every sampling frequency actually to infinity so it continues up and down as well yeah, we get duplicates yeah. yeah and this actually shows us a fundamental problem in digital that is if the frequency content is too wide in mm. frequency then these two would have overlapped you see in this particular instance it's actually okay yeah and actually there's a theorem called the shannon assembling frequency so it's a Shannon sampling theorem that tells us that if the signal has a content up to a certain frequency, mm. then we must sample at least double that amount. Yeah. So, you know, normal uh, acoustic signals, we say that the ear goes up to 20 kilohertz. That means that we should at least sample at 40 kilohertz. Yeah. This is led to the CD standard mm. of 44.1. Okay, and that's to retain d- detail in the recording? Well, uh, uh, let me go on because uh, what usually happens is that we then um, apply a low pass filter mm? to make sure that there's no frequency content above the Nyquist frequency. Okay. This, is, this frequency is actually called the Nyquist frequency whereas the sampling rate is also called the Nyquist rate. Okay. And the Nyquist rate has to be at least double that of the Nyquist uh, frequency. Okay. And with a low pass filter, we make sure that the fr- uh, signal is contained below the uh, Nyquist mm. uh, frequency. Yes. If that was not the case, it would be, as I said, let, let's just try to apply to this if it would have continued then this would also have continued and down here they would add and go up like this okay. so you get something completely different yeah this is aliasing so things begins to look like something that it's not anymore and so I guess uh, alias yeah. yeah and i guess that sounds terrible well it's completely terrible yeah. completely unacceptable that's why we apply the low-pass filter to avoid 
the aliasing to be significant. Okay. Because no filter can attenuate infinitely. No. But as long as it's uh, uh, very much so you don't hear it, then mm. it's no problem. But now I would actually go one step further and explain why the chain is solid and we don't lose any uh, information by using DSP. If we just apply this simple rule that you have to sample at the double frequency. Mm. And that's because we can make these, this, this is actually a sequence of numbers, yeah. right? And usually the numbers would go uh, between zero and one. Mm. Yes. Down here, we could say, okay, now we go back to analog. What would happen then? Well, from the very beginning, let me just uh, make uh, a little indication. What are the digital values at these instances of time? Something like this, mm. right? If you actually obey this rule yeah. and there's no aliasing, and you make another uh, low pass filter again mm. over here because I need to again have the frequency domain like this. And over here now you have all these instances of uh, frequencies. Yeah. And if you make a low pass filter, so let me just draw it again. It's difficult to make the same drawing <laughs> over and over, right? <laughs> it is. But I think everybody can see I'm trying to at least, right? I, I, at least I get it, Jan. <laughs> I get it. Okay, that's it's good. the same. That's good. Uh, then the point when you go from digital to analog is X to apply the low pass filter once more and capture only the original spectrum, mm. not these extra spectrums that actually spectra that came just because it's digital. Mm. And in digital, everything uh, is cyclic. So it comes yeah. back and comes back and comes back again. So if you do a perfect low pass filter here mm. again, what you get, uh, and this surprises some people actually, what you actually get between the points now is actually the exact same as before. Okay. So let me try this time. <laughs> yes, it was something like this, but also you get these details in between. You see, yeah. if you uh, look up here, and then it goes down, and then steeply down to the point, and then a little wriggle here, and a little wriggle there, and up and down, something like this. So actually, if you actually just obey the Shannon theorem, uh, the sampling theorem, yeah. you actually get back the exact same signal. From those small Not just a straight point no. or some smooth point between these uh, digital values. You actually get everything back because you have retained the exact uh, uh, um, uh, information in the frequency domain. Because you've abide to the laws. Of course, of if you zoom in yeah. and say, okay, not everything is completely ideal. We cannot make an ideal low pass filter no. that does not change things up here. And this is actually a very good example of a lot of people have asked me, why do we go to that high sampling frequency? Mm. Well, that's exactly because of this. Because usually, if I just indicate again the Nyquist uh, frequency, so that was the half of the sampling frequency. Mm -hmm. At that frequency, this low pass filter must be way down, like 90 decibels, yeah. 120 decibels, something like this, way down. Mm. But on the other hand, it must continue long enough that it doesn't alter the original uh, music. Mm. So if, the, for instance, at an old fashioned like a CD player, you go to, you have signals up to 20 kilohertz. So the low pass filter cannot start doing something after until 20 kilohertz, but at the half uh, of the sampling uh, frequency, that's to 22.05 kilohertz uh, point. Uh, then it has to be very, very steep yeah. because it starts going down at 20 kilohertz mm. and already at 22, it must be way, way down. Yeah. 
this is the reason where we then have a higher sampling uh, frequency because now the Nyquist frequency also doubles mm. or triples or four doubles and so, so you have more much more room to do yeah. a more general uh, filtering and also we can push the filter so much above the frequencies of the music so it doesn't change the music no. too much Retaining because one thing is the amplitude response which is the level yeah. here but any filter also changes the time mm. that's what's called phase response and phase response usually go one decade below uh, the cutoff frequency. Mm. So if the cutoff frequency was 20 kilohertz, as low as two kilohertz, there will be slight phase distortion. Okay. Yes. But I think all of this points to, or actually uh, explains much better, how can you make a perfect copy? Mm. Because once you get into the digital domain, everything can be copied completely mm. because it's numbers. Yeah. It's easy to copy a number, it's a series of numbers, than uh, as you True. saw when yeah. I was trying to do the drawing. <laughs> it's difficult to do a, a perfect copy of a, an analog signal, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's way easier to copy a, a zero. Yeah. Yes, and this is why when we, once we're in the digital, we can do as many copies mm. as we like and do a co full control. Yes. Yes. And uh, the surprising thing is that if we really do it the right way, we can actually get all the details back, mm. not just like straight lines between the mm. sampling points. Yes. Yeah, because that surprised me a bit, right? Yeah. How can you go from that to you know retaining all of the curves and all of the small well, uh, dips and yeah? But that's the information that is found in this figure. Yeah. All the information here was the same as up here. Mm. And up here was the frequency content of the whole signal. Of the whole with signal. all these regles and stuff. Exactly. Yes. So th it's to the extent that this uh, spectrum is the same as below mm. here. Then at analog to digital to analog again can be perfect. So it's all a matter of doing it the right way and having full control. Yeah, that's impressive. Guys, we are fast approaching the end of today's episode. Uh, as you can see, we've only started to dip our toes in this uh, topic. And uh, I think there's a lot more to say. Well, actually, to be honest, I'm more than eager to come back and tell much more about what DSP can do, because it's a multitude of possibilities. Yeah. It's only the sky's the limit, really. Mm. And there's so much more, and I think we just covered the very basics of why DSP has a home in high-performance audio. Yeah, and uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on, Jan. We've tried something new with the whiteboard today, and I really look forward to doing that again. Um, thank you guys for all of the great questions that we got. It's been a pleasure to host this uh, episode. Thank you. Thank you.